Thanks. So I'll give a brief introduction to the Medicine Quality Research Group, talk about one of our core projects, and then Celine will talk about a project that she's leading. So we're a small group based in Oxford, originated uh, in Laos and uh, moved to the UK to afford the pandemic with multiple global partners trying to address this neglected public health problem. So the key objectives are to understand the epidemiology of substandard or falsified medical products. We use the term falsified now instead of counterfeit in public health terms. What are their impact? Innovative screening technologies for the detection in post-market surveillance and looking at novel forensic tools that might give us clues as to where falsified medicines have come from and to use that to influence policy and implementation and also to build more research groups on this. There are very few globally. Our main funding is from uh, a Welcome, um, the, the Gates Foundation, uh, and some from the World Health Organization to the UKRI. So these are the main projects we're currently working on. I'll talk a little bit about Forest Fire and V, uh, and Celine will talk about Epion. And we're starting to discuss having a repeat International Conference on Medicine Quality and Public Health um, in 2025. We had one in, in 2018 here, but the um, pandemic messed up further plans. So the Forest Fire Project is coordinated uh, by Dr. Celine Hawke, who's here. And this is a Wellcome Trust collaborative award to try to gain insight into the origin of falsified antimicrobials. There's lots you'll read in the newspapers about they come from here or here or here. But the actual objective public domain evidence for that is very meager. And then we're working with um, the uh, sociologists and uh, criminologists um, in the Department of Sociology here on social network analysis on trade routes that Alberto mentioned earlier today. And we're looking at environmental DNA and stable isotope analysis to try and work out where falsified medicines have come from, building on the pollen analysis work that we did uh, over 10 years ago. We're also working with Ben Cooper and Sean and others in uh, Graham and the AMR groups in Oxford on trying to understand uh, the impact of SF antimicrobials on patient outcome and on resistance. The Forest Fire team through the, the wonderful grant from the Wellcome Trust has allowed us to uh, expand to uh, multiple partners uh, all over the world interested in this. But the project I'll allude to um, today is the Vaccine Identity Evaluation Project, that for various reasons we didn't talk about much during the pandemic, I'll explain why. It's really to understand the epi epidemiology and detection of substandard and falsified vaccines. And this is in collaboration with the Department of Biochemistry, Department of Chemistry here, and the Rutherford Appleton Lab at Harwell. So substandard vaccines are either due to errors in, in factories, as in the Baltimore disaster with the COVID vaccine a few years ago, um, or with um, a temperature excursions of vaccines, either freeze-thawed when they shouldn't be freeze-thawed or heated up when they should not be heated up. And there's, there are, there's been lots of work on vaccine viral monitors, but they're still not used on all vaccines globally. Falsified vaccines, the first one I'm aware of was from the 1940s, and they're due to, by definition, to criminal fraud. Multiple examples uh, pre-pandemic and then within the pandemic. And Kaelin Van Asch, uh, before starting her DPhil, um, spent uh, one and a half years trying to monitor the all the public domain inf information on um, SF um, uh, COVID medical products, especially vaccine. And as you can see, um, they were um, uh, very widespread. So in V, the Vaccine Identity Evaluation Project that's been funded by two anonymous philanthropic families in, in WHO, we've been trying to evaluate existing devices to see whether they could use for detecting SF vaccines in supply chains. Molditoff, of which there are two at the JR and two down in the science area, widely used for identifying bacteria spatially offset Raman spectroscopy that you all have seen without realizing it at the end of the security line at uh, Heathrow and Gatwick and I think 150 other airports around the world for looking in a bottle without having to open it. And this was invented by Pavel Matusek, who's at the right there. 
um, and we've been trying to see whether this will be able to detect SO vaccines in supply chains. Because we couldn't go in a laboratory during the pandemic, the first experiments were in the boot of a car in the Oxford rain, as, as illustrated here. And we're also um, working on lateral flow assays that look very promising, and also a whole spectrum of lower cost techniques. But how to engage appropriately over this? As I said, we didn't really discuss this very much during the pandemic because of trust collapse in vaccines. We did not want falsified and some standard vaccines to be used by the more extreme anti-vaxxers as another weapon, if you like, to beat the vaccine right. that were essential for us all. But how to get the right balance in terms of um, uh, discussing these issues we are now, but uh, things are hopefully, it's now a more appropriate time to discuss this. But also we're very concerned that some of the technologies that we're um, investigating, uh, if we publish too much about it, um, uh, criminals could find ways to bypass those. So we've developed a system for outside experts in this field to advise us what to redact so that we don't make it too easy for the criminals to be able to bypass this. But it's a very difficult thing to try and do no harm, to, to do good. You may have heard of the disasters of diethylene and ethylene glycol poisoning in cough and paracetamol syrup over the last few years. The first uh, disaster was in '36, which led to the revamping of the FDA in the USA. In the USA. But there have been multiple examples over the last year. So we have a small grant from the uh, Gates Foundation to try and see whether the techniques we're evaluating in the vaccine project could also be used to form accessible tools for detecting DEG and, and EG. Thank you. I hand over to Celine. Thank you, Paul. So um, um, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk today about Epion, which is the name of a tool that was developed um, by all these people, uh, the main one being the IT person, the first name. Um, and uh, the WHO uh, with budget from the WHO. So it's a tool to conduct surveys to uh, investigate the quality of medicines in countries with limited resources. Um, so just a little bit of context, the field of medicine quality is relatively new and there is really very scarce data to, to understand the extent of the problem. And one, a few examples are the, the few systematic reviews we published in the last three years. Um, where we found only 106 uh, prevalence surveys, so surveys to, to, to uh, assess the extent of the problem uh, between 92 and 2020 uh, for antibiotics, uh, 19 surveys only for cardiovascular medicines, and very, very limited numbers of these surveys actually follow a, a, a very good quality methodology, including there is no randomization of the pharmacies where to, uh, to sample. So there is really a need for more and better quality data, and uh, there are guidelines, very, uh, very big guidelines with 30 pages from the WHO to conduct this, this survey. They are quite complex to conduct. And so um, uh, recently, the, the unique system that is the WHO member state mechanism, that is a system created in 20, 2012 that um, convened member states uh, to um, to discuss and decide and prioritize activities to address the issue of sub substandard and falsified medicines. So the, the member state mechanism uh, uh, advocated for uh, having a tool to help uh, uh, regulators in, in limited resources countries to uh, conduct these types of surveys to actually know what's, what the problems are and where. And so uh, we conducted this work with the WHO, so funded by the WHO and coordinated by them to develop this tool. And the key, the key words, the key instructions, I would say, that we had to develop it is uh, user friendliness and uh, intuitivity. Um, uh, so, uh, and also they wanted it to be a generic tool because each survey in different settings will follow different approaches. So uh, some of you I've, I've heard this morning mentioning mention of REDCap uh, or Castor. So it's a, it's, it's a bit similar tool, but really adapted for re regulator uh, uh, in, in limited resources. It's very hard to explain, and it's an online tool. It's very hard to explain an online tool on slides. So I have some videos, 
But just as a context, um, uh, one important thing, as I just said, is that each survey will be conducted a bit differently in different contexts. Um, and uh, I'm taking an example as an example here, the configuration for uh, the Tanzanian regulator, where we piloted Epion, we piloted the tool in Tanzania. But for any every survey, we will have a coordinator. So at the top of the of the picture here, um, in Tanzania there were regional survey managers uh, who are supervising collectors. So the collectors being the ones collecting the medicines in the pharmacies and health facilities. Uh, and there was a lab coordinator, so the laboratory where the tests of the quality of the medicines were done, uh, that who supervised laboratory technicians. But what does this uh, survey coordinator do, does in Epion? Um, so Epion is really helping the coordinator with limited uh, um, knowledge in, in these types of surveys to uh, set up a methodology for it. Um, it, it helps uh, him or her to uh, randomize the outlets where the, the samples, the medicine should be collected by uploading a predefined list of pharmacies and doing a randomization. Different types of randomizations are possible, simple, stratified, etc. And that's only pressing one button, so which is really interesting in that case. The, also, the coordinator will assign activities to the different actors of the surveys a little bit as in red cap for those who know. Um, and I think that's it. Oh uh, yeah. So once the, the list of outlets has been done, uh, uploaded to Epion system, uh, Epion will create a map uh, of the outlets that were selected for, uh, for, for visit by the collectors. That's very useful to then assign to specific uh, uh, regional survey managers, the regional survey managers being the ones supervising directly the collectors to assign these outlets to them uh, so that the collectors can then uh, also be assigned the outlets. So we will have a look at the at the video that's a bit more easy to understand on the role of some of the activities the regional survey managers uh, do. So hopefully it's gonna work. It's a video that was made for the training of the, TM, the Tanzanian regulators for the pilots. Once you're logged into the Epion tool, your first task is to create collector's account. Click on the Tasks tab and add a collector. Here you will need to add their name and their email address. The collectors will receive an email with a link to download and install the app on their smartphone. Don't worry if you make a mistake. You can easily delete the collector's account by clicking on the trash can icon. If for some reason the collector did not receive your email or accidentally deleted it, you can resend the link to them by clicking on the envelope icon. This will send the link to that email address again. Your next task is to create an assignment for the sample collectors. Click on the tasks and choose Assign Outlets and List of Outlets from the drop-down menu. Choose a collector on top of the page. Here I have Natalia and John, so I'm going to choose John and assign a task to him. To assign an outlet, simply tick the box next to the name of the outlet you would like to assign. That's just to have a, a brief overview. Of... Okay, let's have a look now at what, uh, how the collectors can use Epion. So um, when they collect the medicines in the pharmacies, they have to fill in some information. Uh, and in, in, in that survey in Tanzania, the WHO had printed a form on a bag where the, the collectors would actually then put, so fill in information, put in the bag, the medicines, and it's, it's then filled. Um, and so, but they also have to uh, do to enter this information in the database. Uh, in that case, in Epion. So um, the good. So that's that's what the interface looks like. It's a it's a smartphone uh, interface. It's not an app, but it's a, a website that looks like an app on the phone. Uh, we will have a video as well. The good thing about it is that they can do the data entry. Uh, in Epion offline and then save later online when they have a stable Wi-Fi connection or internet connection. Uh, and it also uses uh, optical character recognition to, um, WHO was uh, keen on having a tool that will uh, reduce the, the work that the collectors are doing. So instead of having to re-enter this uh, entirely on Epion, 
um, uh, a tool, the OCR, will read directly the information and enter it in the database. But let's have a look at the video. To start your assignment, open the Epion app on your smartphone. Before you are assigned samples to collect, this home screen will appear blank. Once your regional survey manager assigns your name to a task, your assignments will appear here. Assignments which have not yet been completed will appear on a clear background. Finished assignments will appear with a green hand icon next to the outlet name. A red hand icon indicates that you have completed an assignment, but it hasn't been handed over yet. To start your assignment, click on the outlet's name to see the outlet's details. If you don't have Wi-Fi or data coverage, you can save the information offline. When you do this and return to the home screen, the assignment will now appear in a red frame and with the disk icon next to it. This indicates that the information you have entered on this assignment was only saved offline and will still need to be saved online. You can continue with your assignment by clicking on the glasses icon which activates the optical character recognition system. Now Epion will ask you to take a photograph of the bag. When taking a photograph of the bag, please follow the good picture guide which you can find at the end of this module. After you have taken a photograph of the bag, adjust the frame of the picture ensuring that the white sticker and the sides of the bag are within the frame and click Submit. Double check the information of the outlet, enter the collection date and specify your approach. Record the temperature and the humidity in the area. If the information on the bag is written clearly, the OCR system will recognize it and automatically fill out the fields in Epion. Check the information. Check the information. Because the uh, optical character recognition is not 100% accurate, especially for those who write uh, with Start very bad writing, like me. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so that's that is basically the the assignment mentioned about. You probably understood that there's the names of the pharmacies. There were Tanzanian pharmacies in here, so they 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 directly have on their phone where they have to collect. There is information on if if available there, there is a gps location you can even click on the map and just uh, just to get the directions from the map uh, directly so that's very useful and so on the back there is a barcode a unique barcode so for each sample and so uh, epion allows to so once the, the 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 medicine has been created in epion you scan the barcode and it's saved with this unique id within epion and at each step of the survey the users, the actors, will scan the, the 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 barcode so that we can track who, where the sample is, and with who and when, since when, basically. So at every steps. Let's now have a look at the the last part of the of the the, the survey, which is a laboratory uh, analysis of the sample. So once the samples are shipped to the lab, there is a coordinator. And the lab coordinator will assign samples to the technicians, to specific technicians, in the same way the regional survey managers assign the outlets, the pharmacies, to the collectors, using Epion again. Uh, and then there is a specific interface uh, um, uh, online for the laboratory for entering the laboratory test results. And also one a nice feature of the of Epion, it, it contains dashboards. So dashboards for dashboards for monitoring the survey, such as this one. So we haven't worked too much on the design of the dashboard yet. Apologies, uh, but we will. Um, so this this dashboard, for example, shows the number of samples that have been collected out of the number of samples expected to be collected. Uh, in you can filter um, by region if you're doing a national wise uh, survey. You can have a look whether there is a specific problem with the survey in a specific region for a specific collector, etc. There is also dashboards for monitoring the results um, of, of the, the lab tests, for example. Importantly, APN saves data in whole same, a whole same database uh, that is secured and relational. Um, there is many other features I haven't shown. Um, we have finished this pilot, and we are uh, working with uh, the WHO to make uh, Epion more generic because it's been tested for Tanzania configuration, but not for other configurations. So uh, this is led by uh, Ido now. Uh, Kaylin here uh, is leading that, so we are we are discussing contracts. Thank you.